done that. But can we again, amen, just marinate in his presence. Once you make a declaration, say, God, I'm going to give... I'm going to give my all to you in this service today. I'm going to give you all of my heart, my mind, and my soul. God, I know you're going to speak to me. Would you begin to do that right now? Would you participate in this service with your worship, with your heart? Let's do that right now in Jesus' name.
have Brother Walter come this morning to take up our tithes and our offerings. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we come to your throne and we ask God that you bless those that have to give and those that do not, God. Strengthen us, God, and bless us beyond measure. God, we thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen. Amen. that are suffering in this world of turmoil that we're finding ourselves in in these last days. With this sickness going around with the wars and the rumors of wars and everything else, we're truly in the end times. But we serve a God who's still on the throne and who's never left us nor forsaken us. And we can watch the news and we can worry and worry and worry and the devil will put fear in your heart. But God's got everything under control in the name of Jesus. Do we have any prayer requests on this side over here? Any prayer requests? Sister Paul. Okay, amen, amen. Anyone else on this side? Anyone on this side have any requests? Sister Belma. Anyone on stage have any requests? Let's all bow our head. If you need prayer in your body, you can come up afterwards and the ministry can lay hands on you. Lord Jesus, we come to your throne, God, and we thank you and we praise you, God, for being a God of action, God. And you see all those, God, it seems like the overwhelming, God, the overwhelming thing is sickness, God, in our bodies, God, but you are our healer, God. You're God that can restore, God, and by your stripes, God, we are healed, God. And you see those that are suffering in their bodies, God, those that need comfort, those that need healing, God, and health restored, God. You are our healer, God. You can mend the brokenhearted, God. You can heal grief, God, and you can give comfort, God. And we thank you, God, for restoration, God, and salvation in your name, God. And above all else, God, we know, God, that you're a holy God and a faithful God. And we thank when you praise your holy and majestic name this morning. Amen. If anybody does need prayer, the ministry will lay hands on you.
that he's never failed you. Can we just take a second and give him some glory and some honor? He's so deserving of it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, you've been so good to us. God, we can't count all the blessings all the time that you showed up. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. I am a witness of that, that he'll do it again and again. Why? Because I belong to him. He is more faithful to you than you're faithful to yourself. Can I say it like this? For you to go to hell, you basically have got to want to because his grace and his mercy is available. And he can do it again. But you have to allow him to do it again. You have to intercede for him to do it again. You have to reach out and touch the Lord for him to do it again. He's willing to do it again. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to everlasting life. But he doesn't force himself upon anybody. That's why he inhabits the praises of his people. When praises go up, blessings come down. When we say, thou son of David, have mercy upon me, he'll stop in his tracks on his way to another destination and take a few moments to give you a miracle, and then he'll move on. But you have to reach out to him and touch the Lord. Y'all remember that old song? Reach out and touch the Lord. You will find he's not too busy. Woo, come on. Come on, choir, that's beautiful. He's passing by right now. Mm. Your needs. So what? And touch the Lord as he goes by. Woo Can we reach out and touch him right now? needs in the house today. Man, he wants to supply it, don't he?
Let's go to Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Hebrews 13, verse 8. I'll read those two portions of Scripture. Malachi 3 and 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Now we can be fickle. We can change. But he's, he doesn't change. What you see is what you get. And I like what I'm getting from God. Amen. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed because he changes not. Hebrews 13 and 8, very familiar passage. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday. There's kids here. <laughs> you know, you keep on just uh, picking the object you want to fall down, and all you got to do is push that, that button. It's kind of like how some people view God, you know. If I can just push my want button for God, and he'll keep on dropping the things that I need until the machine is empty. But when the machine is empty, then we think it's all over. We forget that there is a... a vending machine personnel that's going to come and restock the vending machine but some people's perspective and view of God that once the chips and snicker bars run out and all the blessings of God run out and all the provisions of God uh, run out that there's no more supply they forget that he owns the cattle of a thousand hills not a thousand cattles on one hill but he owns the cattle of a thousand hills he he's limitless God's has no cap about him there's no lid about God amen you can ask of God and God will provide if God did it then God will do it now and if God does it now God will do it tomorrow yes he's the same yesterday today and forever some people treat God like 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 he's able to you know handle those little problems but when it comes to my big problems I, I guess I better just handle those on my own because I'm it's tangible and I, he's intangible and I can't see him though I can feel him from time to time and this is a big issue and I better put my own knowledge and intellect and and experience if you will into it to 
try to bring some resolve about this new problem I have. It's big, and so some people view God like that. He can handle my little stuff, but the big problems, because they're tangible and relational, um, I better just take care of those myself. Some people treat God like he is a weak and puny God. They don't even really believe in God. In fact, some people, maybe someone here today, a few of you here, maybe you feel like God can't do much at all. Amen. But I want to preach to you today that he is more than able to meet your needs and not your needs tomorrow, which he will. But today, if you have a problem and a need, if you need provision, regardless what it is, I'm here to tell you that God can meet your needs need right now. He's a right now God, but God just doesn't do it because you think it. You got to open up your lips and your heart and participate and be serious like Bartimaeus. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, God. I need a right now, God. I need you to move in my situation right now. How many of you believe in a right now, God? Clap your hands to the Lord. Amen. I want to tell us that his arm is not short. His ear is not deaf. He is not slack concerning his promise. His promises are yea and in him. Amen. His love is far reaching. His power has not dried up. His word is still true. When you need him, he will be there. And I want to let you know, if he has done it once, he will do it again. And if he did it again, he'll do it again. And if he does it again, you can be sure that he'll do it again. <laughs> Clap your hands. Got an amen corner. Let me say this. He's not a one-time God, but he is an on-time. Come on, somebody. I'm here to tell you, he just doesn't do it once and leaves it alone and expects you to figure it out. If he's given you wisdom once, he'll do it again. If he's blessed your finances once, he'll do it again. If he's filled you with the Holy Ghost once, he will do it again. He's a God that's on time and will bless you again. Everybody say again. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 1, it's his second letter, Paul, to the church in Carmel. And he has been through some things, if you would. And we know he's been stoned, left for dead a couple times, had stripes on his back three times, shipwrecked twice. He's got troubles within the church and troubles and threatenings outside of the church. And he's been through it, but God, his grace has been sufficient for him. When he's weak, he is strong, and he's just given a little bit of, of what's going on to the church in his second letter. And watch this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 9 through 10. But we had the sentence of death. You talk about living for God in rough times. He says we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but rather let's trust in God which raiseth the dead. Amen. I want to trust in a God that can raise the dead. He's basically saying because if I'm left for dead, he can rise me up. So I'm going to put my trust in him. Watch. Who delivered us? Say he did it. And then he says, from so great a death and doth deliver. Say he does it. Not only did he did it, but God does it. Not only did he did it yesterday, but God can does it today. In whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. He's saying that he did it, he does it, and he will do it. I said God does it, God did it, God does it, and God will do it. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want you to look at this other version. It's the CEV version, contemporary version of that scripture. It says, God saved us from the threat of death, and we are sure that he will do it again and again. I just want to encourage somebody today he is one God. Hero Israel, he is one God, but he's not a one-time God. He will supply our need again and again and again. 
I feel like there might be some people here, and I'm trying my best to preach. I'm sicker than a dog right now, but I believe he's going to touch me. I need you to preach with me here today. Maybe you need God again. You need to rise to your feet right now and say, God, I need you again. I need you to touch my emotions again. I need you to touch my mind again. I need you to touch my body again. I need you to move in my family again. I need a dose of the Holy Ghost again. I need an answer again. I need you to move in my home again. I need you to move in my job and my situation again. I need you to heal my back again. Touch my shoulder and all my body again. Touch my mindset and my perspective again. When's the last time you came to God again? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Clap your hands to a God that likes to do it again. Israel. Israel's at war with the Philistines. Again, <laughs> this time, there's a giant. And as the custom was, <clears throat> he was in the valley of Elah. And the Philistines was on one uh, foothill, if you would, and Israel the other. And they would meet in the middle. And this giant, for many days and nights, is threatening Israel. Bring me out, somebody, so I can slay him. You're fixing the service, Israelites. Well, Jesse told David, the young son, he wasn't old enough and allowed really to go to battle yet, but the brothers were. We know the story. Here, take some bread and some cheese and some stuff with you and see how your brothers fare, see how they're doing. And so he goes and he gets there and he understands that this Philistine giant, this uncircumcised Philistine giant is, is defying the armies of Israel and his God and whom he loves and uh, he, he don't like it. He realizes his brothers and the other so-called men of war are uh, knocking at their knees, if you would. They're a little fearful. And, and so David, he says, is there not a cause, amen, for us to take care of business? We're in warfare, amen? And so he goes to Saul, and they have a conversation. And that's where we find ourselves in 1 Samuel 17, 32 and 37. And David said unto Saul, mind you, Saul, is the king. David at this time is only the shepherd boy. He's only really worked with sheep. Now he has had a sling and he knew how to uh, sling those rocks really well. I'm sure he had a lot of practice in keeping off the animals, off his father's sheep. But he's not really a man of war if you would. Or is he? And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant. He's saying, Saul, hey, I'm a young boy, but I'll go and I'll fight with the Philistine. Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. I want the young people to hear me here today. There's no excuse. You can't be used by God. You hear me. He was a young kid. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion, and there came a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and I smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. He's saying this joker that's out here got everybody fearful. I see him just like that lion and that bear. He'll be defeated. God will be with me again in this battle. Man, he said, I slew the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine should be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. Now watch. David said, moreover, the Lord that, past tense, delivered me. That delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me. He that delivered me is the same God that will still the God that filled me with the Holy Ghost over 23 years ago is the same God that will fill me with the Holy Ghost today. Come on, somebody. 
God that healed me, healed my wife in 2005 is the same God that can give my wife a miracle today. If you was healed several years ago, don't put it out of your mind that that was only a one-time thing. He's not a one-time God. He's an on-time God. He is a God that does it again and again and again. But it's up to the people of faith to rise up and say, hey, I'm more than able to conquer. I'm more than able to do this. I'm more than able to fight. And we know the story. He went to that Goliath in the name of the Lord and he knocked him down and grabbed his own sword and he cut his head off. Some of you need to cut the head off of the beast that you've been fighting. You need to trust God again through the problem that you're facing. I wish I had a witness right now. I can't preach it like I want to, but I want to tell you that he'll do it again. That if he did it for you yesterday, he'll do it for you today. And he'll do it for you tomorrow. said go today go the Lord be with thee someone here needs to reminisce of the time that God gave you those mighty victories the times that you killed spiritually speaking proverbially speaking you killed your bear and your lion and now you're looking at this other situation like it's too big it's not too big God gave you the faith and the courage and the strength to kill those things you can kill that thing that's attacking you. You got to believe that your God will do it again. Say, so he'll do it again. And I want to let us know he will do it again from one generation to the next. Elijah was walking by. He saw Elisha. And he called him to go with him, basically. And Elisha left. He was plowing, actually, in the field. And he left everything. He followed this great man of God by the name of Elijah. And there was a time that Elijah was kind of the master, if you would, of the sons of the prophets. He was teaching different men, young men, the things of God. And it kind of separated Elisha away from them and said, I, I got to go from Gilgal and go to Bethel. He was going to these different places. And Elisha said, I'm not staying back. Wherever you go, I'm going. I'm going wherever you go. I'm not keeping my face. And I'm paraphrasing, but. I'm not going to keep my eyes off you, Elijah. Amen. And he went to the next town. He says, now I need you to stay here. You know, I'm going wherever you go. He looked to the next generation. He loved and respect his elder. Amen. And he said, I'm going wherever you're going to go. I'm going to learn of you, man of God. Amen. And so they get to a place and... Uh, a uh, 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 water, excuse me, I got lost for a second. They got into a, 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 a water deal that they needed to cross. And Elijah took his mantle and he wrapped it together and he smote the waters there at the river. And the waters, as it was for uh, the, the, as the children of Israel went into uh, Canaan's land and as God opened up the waters at the Red Sea, he opened up the waters again when Elijah used his mantle, which represented his anointing, he smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. And he did this in front of Elisha, and Elisha saw that there was power with Elijah, but there was something awesome about that mantle that God has given him. And by the way, that mantle was camel's hair. In fact, Jewish historians, amen, like Josephus say, it's the same mantle that John the Baptist wore in the New Testament because there's scripture about the spirit of Elijah that was upon John the Baptist. That's just a little side note there. But there was some power in that mantle. And he says, tell me what it is that you want from me. Amen. I want that mantle. And it was time for Elijah to be raptured, if you would, from the Lord. He says, when you see me, when it's my time to come, and you lay, don't keep your eyes off of me, then you can have this mantle. And again, I'm paraphrasing. We understood what had happened, that a whirlwind came and a chariot of fire came, and Elijah was gone at that, but he kept it, he was gone and, and disappeared, if you would. Amen. And that mantle came down, and Elisha took up that mantle. Look at verse 14. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. 
because when he was taken, the mantle fell, and he took that mantle from that elder, and he smote the same waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? He was saying, where is the anointing of my elder? Where is the anointing of that past generation of Pentecost? Where is the God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha, as he had before, when Elijah had smote the waters, he went over. God did it once for Elijah, but he did it again for Elisha. I want to talk to this church about the truth. This apostolic heritage that we have, it still works. It's still powerful, and it's the only thing that's right. Everything God did for them, he's going to do for us in this generation. But we have a responsibility that we have got to take the mantle and live consecrated before God. And those waters they cross are the waters we can cross. And those lions they defeated are the same lions we can defeat. If God did it for our elders, God will do it for this end-day church. He'll do it again. If he did it for Billy Wayne Lewis, he'll do it for Sean Daniel Lewis. And not because I hold onto his coattail, but because I have my own relationship with God and I have the mantle to continue to preach this only truth, this only saving message that there is. Everybody say he'll do it again. Amen. You look at the Holy Ghost in Acts 2, 1 through 4. We know the story. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. It appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. And man, these folks that were there because it was the Jewish feast of Pentecost. They, they, everybody was there from the areas around. All the Hebrews were there to celebrate. It, it was custom. And they, they thought they were filled with new wine, thought they were drunk. And he says, we're not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel that in the last day said, God, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And, and they were the recipients of that. And they, they begin to speak with other tongues. But I want to tell you something. God did it again. Because Peter got to get up and to preach. They were convicted. They said, men and brother, what shall we do? And Peter said in Acts 2.38, you should repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Here it is. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, the promise is unto you. It's going to happen to you, but it's also going to happen to your children. It's going to say it's going to happen again. Not only will it happen to you, but it will happen to the ones that come after you. Say it will happen again. And to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And guess what happened? The Holy Ghost was poured out again. In Acts chapter 10, a man by the name of Cornelius, as, as, yet, as while Peter was yet preaching, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. It happened again in Acts 19. He laid his hands upon them after he asked them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we didn't know if there was any Holy Ghost. And how was you baptized? And he went through a Bible study. He baptized them in Jesus' name. And then he, when he laid his hands on them, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance and prophesied. It happened again. My friend, the Holy Ghost is not just a one-time thing. You don't just get the Holy Ghost and say, well, I'm sliding into heaven. I don't have to do nothing else. I can just live on the Holy Ghost. My friend, you're wrong. That's the beginning. That's the initial step. You can get the Holy Ghost every time you come back to church. You can speak in tongues in your home, at the laundromat, in your car. You got to begin. You got to live a spiritual life, my friend. You got to be spiritual. It can happen again and again and again. If the only time is you get the Holy Ghost is when you come to church. I question your Christianity. You should be filled with the Holy Ghost every single day of your life. It can happen again and again and again. We're not careful. We come to church and we had a good altar experience and we got what we need. Praise God. But we'll wait four more weeks before we worship. No, no. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. It's a responsibility that we have to worship again. To worship again. When we do again, he'll do again. 
What happens if he lives by that? I won't do nothing else again until you do something else again. Some of us be in trouble. While you're in here, knowing that he's a God that does it again, yeah, he's a one God, but he's not a one-time God. He's an on-time God. I'm going to come in here and give him all the praise. If he never blesses me again, I'm still going to bless him all the rest of my days of my life. I love being part. Come on, somebody. I love being part of the church. And I want to bless him again and again so he can bless me again and again and again. Say he'll do it again. Clap your hands again, won't you? Sister Donovan, in Genesis chapter 5 and 24, says, And Enoch, he walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. His ways pleased the Lord, we read about. And I don't understand, Sister Tina, what happened here, but he translated him. He raptured him and took him away. What's the next verse I gave you, Sister Lindsay? Let's go to that one. Second Kings 2, I just read that one. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold, their appearance, there appeared rather a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and it parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. God did it once for Enoch, and God did it again for Elijah. These two never died a natural death. The only two that never died a natural death, amen, that we read about and know is Enoch and Elijah. But church, if he resurrected them, if he raptured them, guess what? He's going to do it again for the church. You think we're down here in vain? Do you think we're living God? And you think we're patty caking for Jesus for no purpose, my friend? We're part of a covenant. We belong to Him. We're blood bought. We're spirit filled, and we gotta try and take everybody we can with us. But I know for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. But I'm not living here. I'm a pilgrim just passing through. There's Beulah Land that I'm looking for. There's a Crystal Sea. There's walls of jasper. Gates of pearl. I see Paul. I see Timothy. But most of all, I see Jesus. There's a place in heaven for you and me. God will do it again for the church. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I believe Brother Buddy's going to beat us. Come on, somebody. You love Brother Buddy? We miss him, don't we? I said he's going to beat us. <laughs> if the Lord comes back tomorrow, that is. I don't know. We might all hit the grave. You never know what's going to happen here. Well, that message just went sour, didn't it? Then we which are alive and remain, say that's me, shall be caught up together with them. Who? The dead that's going to rise first in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air like Elijah and Enoch. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, my friend. Amen. He raptured those individuals. You better be for sure that God will rapture the church He's going to do it again. God is the same yesterday. If he did it then, he'll do it now, and he'll do it tomorrow. We serve a God that likes to repeat. We serve a God that is repetitive. We serve a God that will do it again. Clap your hands to the Lord. I want to close with this unique story. Am I doing okay? Not feeling well? Am I, am I making it? Okay. Give, give, give me a hand clap. Make me feel better. There we go. I'm just messing. I really am just messing. But thank you. Mark chapter 8, verse 22, 25. Very different, different ways of God works. And I'm going to need a, to use somebody here for this one. He cometh to Bethsaida. Stay with me here because I'm, I'm going to be wrapping it up, okay? Jesus came to 
the stadium there, right off the Sea of Galilee, one of those seaports. And, and they bring a blind man unto him. And he besought to touch him. He wanted to touch and help this guy. And he took the blind man by his hand. Come here, Walter. I'm sorry, that was pretty disgusting. You're blind, by the way. Close your eyes. Takes him by the hand. Hey, I got to take you away from everybody. Come on, I got to take you out of town. Do you trust me? We'll be back. I got to heal him. I got a spit in your eyes. All right? All right, come on. You see? You really put your glasses back on. I want you to follow that. Let me tell you something. Thank you, Brother Walter. If this was you, see, y'all couldn't really handle the real Jesus today. Come on. We get mad when the preacher steps on our toes sometimes. He met. He said, generation of vipers, you hypocrites. Let me spit on your eyes and heal you. That was Jesus. So Evan, I don't know why he did, but he spit on his eyes. Now, I, I would say Jesus is a gentleman, and he spit in his hand and touched his eyes, or he just spit in his face. I don't know. But he used some saliva and put his hands upon him, and that, don't go to the next one yet. And he asked him if he saw all, or basically, what do you see now? Amen. Sometimes Jesus, you hear me, when you want him to move again, sometimes he'll use, he, well, he, he used saliva, I should say. If you just feel like something hits you all of a sudden, I don't know. But then he used saliva. He used his hands. A woman was healed with the issue of blood when she touched his garment. His, her, his clothes healed somebody. His word healed somebody. I want to tell somebody something. Never neglect the vehicle or avenue that God uses to bring your miracle. Never question the way God moves in your life. We would never be where we're at here in Fayetteville if some things didn't happen back yonder. Regardless if they hurt, regardless of how they felt, regardless of what happened, all things work together for the good who are the called according to his purpose. And so when you want God to move upon your behalf and touch you again, sometimes he'll use things like saliva, as he did in this instance. There's always a reason for it. So he asked him, can you see, basically? And he looked up. You'll never find another scripture like this. And said, I see men as trees walking. It was kind of a blurry vision. Hey, man, I'm going to preach to you here, and we're going to end it here. But God wants to do something for somebody. Because there's some people here, you've been touched by God before. Amen. And you're better than where you was. But you need another touch. Uh, well, yeah, I used to not be able to speak. see I was spiritually blind. I was in darkness. Or I, I, I got out of this situation and it's doing better. But I know I can be better than where I'm at. You're kind of seeing as men as trees walk. And you can tell they're men, but they look trees. They look tall. You can't really have a clear vision of what's going on. You mean to tell me that Jesus touched somebody and they weren't fully healed? But I don't know if it was Jesus or if it was the individual. 
there's lots of times the Spirit of God's moving and you get touched accordingly by what you put in. You should never leave a service here and say, I didn't get one thing from God. If you say that, it's your fault. It don't matter what kind of bad day you're having. It don't matter if you're sick. It doesn't matter what you're going through. If you open up yourself some way, God will deposit something in your life. That's why we gather together as a church. And so this problem wasn't Jesus' problem here. He had all power in heaven and earth, amen? But there was a problem with the individual that was blind. Maybe there was a little bit of doubt. Maybe there was some type of issue uh, that was there. We don't know, but we do know that when he saw the first time, he sees men as trees walking. After that, I love this story. Jesus put his hands, will you say it with me? Thank you, Sister Terry. Say it with me, and he put his hands... He touched him. He blessed him. We serve a God that wants to bless you again. And so he put his hands again. Up. See, God, when he does a job, he wants to do it right. But it's up to the individual to stay there so he can be blessed. I've known people that come to church and get blessed. They didn't get exactly what they want and you won't see them again. Church, you got to stay with it. Amen. It does, some things don't happen overnight. Healing is a process. Now, sometimes God will touch you, and instantaneously there's a miracle, and it's totally changed. But a lot of times, process there's a process of healing. Amen. And it's for you to learn. So don't get frustrated in the process of your healing. Amen. Now, let me get a little practical. It's not just always spiritual healing. There's emotional healing. There's financial healing. There's healing in the home. Come on, somebody. There's healing of the mind. Maybe you suffer with PTSD. I'm not a veteran. Oh, you don't have to be a veteran to suffer from PTSD. See, I don't even know how to say it no more. Amen. If you've been through some hard things in your life, you can get some anxiety about you. It needs to be healed. And sometimes it just doesn't happen once at the altar. So you got to come. He'll touch you you got to be there for him to touch you again. You have to activate your faith so he can touch you again. You have to move in the Holy Ghost for you to have a miracle again. And so the man is there. What do you see? I see men as trees walking. It's really not quite clear yet, Jesus. But we know he's not the problem. He's fully God, fully man. He put his hands on him again. See, Jesus, amen, he that begun a good work in you will finish it. God is the author and finisher of your faith. God doesn't start something with you and then leave you hanging. We feel that some way because we're not at par where we need. Now I'm really preaching to you. We're not at par where we need to be. And so then we say, Brother Tracy, well, it's God, 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 you know, we, we basically, if you're not careful, it comes across almost as blaspheme if you're not careful. Well, God started a good work, but now he doesn't care about me. He's aborted me. Now I'm just this bastard child. That word's in the Bible. I didn't cuss. Come on, somebody. He wants to continue to heal you. And sometimes the first touch doesn't give you that completeness that you're looking for. So guess what? You need a second touch. And if you're like me, you need several hundred touches. Does anybody need several hundred touches? Can you know he'll do it again? Clap your hands to the Lord today. He put his hands, say it with me, again upon his eyes. What was the problem? The eyes. See, oh God, the Holy Ghost is speaking through me as I'm preaching. Jesus stayed focused on the problem. He didn't go to something else, and there might have been some other issues with him, but he focused on the problem at hand because sometimes if you can get rid of the root problems, the other problems will. When you can take care of the root problem. So guess what, Matt? He focused on the eyes. He didn't go to something else the second time. He focused on the problem at hand. I feel it in the Holy Ghost today. 
There's some people that are going to come up here today. You need another touch on that same issue and problem. And guess what? There's going to be a different result. Look what happened. He put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up just like he did the first time. It would behoove us that when God touches us, that we leave this altar looking up. Brother Tracy is a man of faith that gets behind this pulpit and, 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 and faith. And you, and you know what? And You may even get tired of it, but I don't want you to get tired of it. He may share some stories, but I'm glad that he does because he encourages our faith. He has seen some things. Because there's lots of times, amen, as he says that when you, you get a healing in your body and all of a sudden you feel a twinge, you'll say, I didn't get healed. We need to start looking up when we come away from the altar. Jesus touched him, now he says, look up. But a lot of people will begin to look down. God didn't do it. God didn't do it. I already felt it. I didn't feel a change. Who says you have to have the Holy Ghost goosebumps for God to heal you? Huh? Well, they ran the owls. They must have got healed. Well, he might have saw one of these brown recluses bite him in the ankle, and he was running. You don't know what happened. Yeah, you laugh about that, but it was you. <laughs> Listen, God's speaking. He put his hands on him again. He said, man, look up. And when he looked up, he was restored and saw every man clearly. It was a process of healing. He needed to be touched again. He needed another dose again. The second touch brought a clear and greater vision to this man. You know what I believe and know from experience? That every time I have my God moments, I see more clear. I get closer to him. I believe more. Because where there is no vision, the people perish. Not only you perish, but the ones in your home can perish too if you're not careful. Or the church can perish. But the clearer my vision is, the better for me and the better for everybody else. And every time I have those God moments, every time God again touches me, every time again happens with me and God, it opens up my eyes more. The scales begin to fall off like it did the Apostle Paul. And I begin to have revelation and understanding. Perspect perspectives get clear. Come on, somebody. We need God to touch us again. Would you lift up your hands right now? Lift up your hands. I hope you're not bored and tired. In fact, if you're bored and tired and ready to eat, won't you go ahead and leave? It, this ain't for you today, but this is for somebody else, amen, that needs a touch from God. You need a second touch. I don't care what it's for. I want you to come right now and let God touch you again. Maybe it's for your body. Maybe it's for your mind. Maybe it's for personal things. It doesn't matter. Amen. I need God to touch me again. Amen. When you come up here, I want you to lift up your hands.